This is AMTV. Hello there everyone, and welcome to part 17 of this series looking at the history and impact of Doctor Who viewing figures. If you're joining us for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. We hope you stick around for future installments and check out our previous episodes. We've covered the first three Doctor's eras and the first five years of the fourth Doctor. But for now, sit back, relax, and join me once again as we delve back into the wonderfully niche world of Doctor Who viewing figures. Our destination? Season 17. By the summer of 1979, Doctor Who was once again gearing up for its now traditional return in September. The programme was doing well, with the previous year's season 16 averaging well over 8 million viewers across its run. However, keen observers noted that this was a marked decrease when looking at how the first few seasons of the Tom Baker era performed. But not to be outdone by history, producer Graham Williams and brand new script editor Douglas Adams were looking to provide the Doctor with more adventures comprised of strong science fiction, whimsical fantasy, and ultimately, engaging characters and storylines to keep audiences coming back in their millions. Whilst this all may sound promising on paper, things were not necessarily all well behind the scenes. Tom Baker, who was entering his sixth year playing the titular Time Lord, was becoming more and more eccentric in both his portrayal of the Doctor, but also just in his manner with members of the production team. Tom himself has said that beginning around this time through to the end of his tenure, that he could be very unreasonable, believing he knew the programme better than anyone else. And to be fair to him, he was one of the longest standing members of the team, but even he now admits that in retrospect, he very easily overstepped the mark on multiple occasions. So, how did this affect the stories that went out on screen? Would the quality suffer from all the goings on behind the scenes, or would they rejuvenate the programme and push audiences to new heights? Let's dive right in and find out. The first story from Season 17 is Destiny of the Daleks. The Doctor and the newly regenerated Romana land on a barren world that seems strangely familiar. The Daleks are searching for a long-buried weapon in their war with the Mavellans. Deep beneath Skaro, Davros waits. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 1st of September 1979 and concluded on the 22nd of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and no, your eyes are not deceiving you, those are the correct numbers. They are staggering to say the least, with every episode soaring over not just 10 or 11, but over 12 million viewers. Part 3 set a new record for a most viewed individual episode, only to be instantly outdone the following week by Part 4, which drew in 14.4 million viewers. It's hardly no surprise then, that when looking at the Top 40 programs chart, all four parts gained a place. The peak position for the story came with Part 4, which settled at 27th. However, it is odd that in previous years, when Doctor Who has climbed to such astronomical heights, that that would make it easily gain a spot in the top 10, but not this time. So, despite these wonderful numbers, how on earth did Destiny of the Daleks manage to pull it off in the first place? Well, whilst I would love to say that millions of people were taken with the fact that the show and the Daleks were coming back, thus prompting the big boost, this is arguably not the case. The main factor into the show's astronomical viewing figures here comes from the distinct lack of competition. That's right, ITV was not on the air at all. On the 10th of August 1979, a technician's dispute prompted the biggest and most impactful strike to hit the other side yet. The ITV network went off the air in 14 of its 15 regions. The only exception was Channel Television, which continued to broadcast in Guernsey and Jersey, albeit on a reduced schedule, but back on the mainland there was no ITV programming for viewers to tune into. This strike would last for 11 weeks, in which time, if you switched channels to ITV, you'd be greeted with this caption card, informing you that there was indeed nothing to watch. So, with the BBC's main rival effectively wiped off the airwaves, viewers on a Saturday night had only one major option if they wanted to watch something on television. Of course, BBC Two existed as well, but being as that was a channel ran by the corporation, it was a win-win either way. Competition being non-existent helped Destiny of the Daleks tremendously, but to be fair, the promotion for the season opener was some of the strongest in years. A week before part one aired, a specially shot two-minute trailer was aired on BBC One. This was original material, showing the Doctor being woken up by an ominous voice, informing him that he would be facing the Daleks again very soon. The trailer is a great bit of fun, and Baker's on top form. It harks back to the specially shot trailers of old, seen for stories like The Web of Fear or The Ambassadors of Death. Another trailer was shown after the previous season's Androids of Tara finished its repeat screening. This one was a montage of clips from the first two episodes, but combined with the specially shot material from a few days prior, 
it's the most promotional hype Doctor Who was attempting to put out for some time. Another factor to take into account is the Daleks themselves. The sinister pepper pots hadn't been seen on screen for over four years, and despite that absence, the appearance and sound of the creatures had not been forgotten by both the children in the school playground, the adults who'd grown up with them, or indeed the licensees who were merchandising them. The Daleks were still very much the Doctor Who monster, so to have them return and have them kick off the new season, I reckon would have definitely boosted numbers somewhat, even if ITV hadn't been off the air. Lastly, the arrival of a new companion also pipped the interest of the more casual viewer, who perhaps didn't tune in every single week. However, this time, things were a bit more complicated. Mary Tam left the part of Romana at the end of the previous season, but with the character being a Time Lord, she also shared the Doctor's ability to regenerate. Thus she did, into Lala Ward, who had previously appeared as Princess Astra in the season 16 finale The Armageddon Factor. This was addressed at the start of Destiny, but after a few random regenerations, assuming Romana isn't just burning up her remaining lives, the Doctor concludes that it'll be okay for his friend to wear the face of someone else. I mean, it's not like he wouldn't do that himself in years to come. In front of me this face. Why this one? Why did I choose this face? Destiny of the Daleks is one of those stories that sounds really good when you explain the premise to someone, and then when you watch it, to some degree, it may feel a little flat. For me though, despite the chiding it gets, I love Destiny of the Daleks in the same way I adore the Invasion of Time. Both are stories that are a bit ropey. I mean, some of the Dalek props look like they're about to collapse apart, but in that ropiness is where the charm lies for me. The actors are giving it their all, despite the circumstances, and the return of Davros when we see him revive is genuinely chilling. The Daleks themselves are at their most shouty, at least when compared to previous serials, and despite screaming do not move at Romana about 15 times, they still have excellent moments within the story that remind you why they became so iconic a threat to the Doctor and his friends. It may not be the best, far from it, but sit down with a few drinks, a couple of snacks, and just allow yourself to bask in the ridiculous fun that is this story. Overall, this story attracted an average of 13.5 million viewers, a staggering 5.4 million increase from the previous season opener, The Reboss Operation. This is the biggest boost between stories that we've seen on our journey thus far, and even though a lot of this increase can be put down to the lack of competition from ITV, to see Doctor Who be so successful in the viewing figures department again is fantastic. This also takes the record for highest average of a Doctor Who story thus far, specifically on its first broadcast. We also have some repeat data for you. Continuing the tradition of two summer repeats before the start of a new season, Destiny of the Daleks was chosen to be the first of these in the 1980 lead-up to season 18. Going out across four consecutive days from the 5th to the 8th of August, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which averaged out at 6.1 million viewers. This may be an over 7 million drop from the broadcast average, but the circumstances have changed dramatically. ITV was now fully back on the air, and it was airing its ever-popular soap opera Crossroads against the Daleks. Despite the appeal of the Twisted Machines, they could not quite eclipse the goings-on in the famous Midlands Motel. That combined with the hot summer weather of the season, which undoubtedly would have kept many audiences outdoors, rather than being cooped up watching the telly. Destiny of the Daleks is one of the most memorable stories of the Tom Baker era for me, purely for how much fun I can get out of it. It's not the best Dalek story ever made, but then it arguably doesn't need to be. It's an odd, ropey, but very watchable adventure, and clearly audiences at the time thought so too, even if they had nothing else to watch. To bask in the ridiculousness of this story for yourself, you can read the Target book from 1979, or the TV soundtrack from 2012. To watch it, you have the singular VHS release from 1994, or as part of a five-story box set, including all the other Dalek stories to feature Davros, released exclusively to WH Smiths in 2001. You also have a standalone DVD release of the story, which came out in 2007. Also in 2007, it was released again alongside the other Davros Dalek stories as part of the Davros collection. Terry Nation's last script for Doctor Who may seem a bit limp when compared to the earlier stories he crafted for his creations, but if you ask me, it still delivers on being a very engaging, entertaining, and overall fun adventure. Highly recommend you check it out if you haven't seen it, just don't be expecting a masterpiece when you see those opening titles roll in. If you're supposed to be the superior race of the universe, why don't you try climbing after us? Bye bye! The second story from season 17 is City of Death. While sampling the delights of Paris, 1979, the Doctor and Romana get caught up in a gamble with time. Why is Count Scarlioni conducting time experiments, and why does he have six Mona Lisas boarded up in his cellar? This story is comprised of four episodes, 
which began airing on the 29th of September 1979 and concluded on the 20th of October. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and if you thought things couldn't get any better, think again. Like Destiny of the Daleks, every episode gained over 12 million viewers, Part 3 setting a new record at 15.4 million, only to be dethroned by Part 4 the following week, which had a staggering 16.1 million viewers tuning in. This is well and truly the most amount of people who watched Doctor Who on first broadcast here in the UK. For the top 40 UK programmes, surprisingly only two of the four parts charted. Part 1, despite having 12.4 million viewers, missed out, finishing 50th. Part 2, which had 14.1 million viewers mind you, also missed out, charting 44th. However, Part 4 gives us the story's highest chart position at 16th place, taking Doctor Who back into the top 20 for quite some time. So with new viewing figures records set once again for the programme, what was it about City of Death itself that kept the audiences hooked? Before we talk about the story, we must address the situation over at ITV. I think it's obvious that as City of Death went out, that the other side was indeed still off the air due to the technician strike. With no competition to combat the BBC, all of their programmes saw a surge in audience sizes, Doctor Who included. The promotional arm for this story was just as strong here as it was for Destiny of the Daleks, the main factor being that City of Death marked the first time that Doctor Who was filmed outside of the UK, with several scenes being shot in the French capital of Paris. Overseas filming was seen as something of a big deal back in the 70s. If your programme was allocated the time and budget to film in real foreign locations, then it gave the show a certain degree of prestige and respect. And considering Doctor Who by this point was frequently cited as a national institution, this small feat helped cement its status within the BBC further. Lala Ward was also featured prominently in the print world, giving numerous interviews about her new role in Doctor Who, accompanied with publicity photos of her and Tom in Paris itself. Another promotional boost came from the launch of a new weekly magazine, one that would be solely catered to the programme. Two days before Part 3, on the 11th of October 1979, the very first issue of Doctor Who magazine, then known as Doctor Who Weekly, hit shelves in shops all across the country. Costing just 12 pence, the magazine gave readers original comic strips, features about upcoming stories, and also delved into the show's past, allowing younger readers to learn about the adventures of the 1960s and early 70s. The launch of the mag was boosted by a promotional tour, in which Tom Baker, in costume as the Doctor, visited numerous places around the UK to greet readers who had picked up the new mag. Doctor Who Weekly continues to live a long and successful life, changing its name to Doctor Who Monthly in 1982, and then Doctor Who Magazine in 1984, a title which it still holds today, over 40 years since its initial launch. City of Death is a story that is widely celebrated amongst fans, a story that embodies so many things that people love about the programme, and with a script largely penned by Douglas Adams of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fame, it all seems obvious why this story is so beloved. The location work in Paris looks fantastic, and the guest characters such as Julian Glover as Scaroth and Tom Chadbon as Duggan gel so well with the established leads. I must admit, I do enjoy the story, but I personally don't hold it in the same high regard as many others do. Definitely give it a watch, it's one that I'd argue most viewers will definitely get some joy out of, and for me, the most joy I get is seeing a lead cast having the time of their lives, and a witty script that leaves you laughing, and in some cases, hoping for more. Overall, this story attracted an average of 14.5 million viewers, a 1 million increase from the previous story. The increase from Destiny of the Daleks now puts City of Death as the number one most viewed Doctor Who story on average, both in terms of first broadcast and also eclipsing repeat viewing figures, which had been held by a 1976 repeat of Pyramids of Mars, which had 13.7 million viewers tuning in. This humongous new average may largely be down to the lack of competition on ITV, but even so, the fact that Doctor Who, a near 16-year-old sci-fi show, could pull in numbers of that magnitude only strengthens the notion that the appeal the programme held was truly timeless. We also have some repeat data for you. City of Death was chosen to be the second repeat to go out in the summer of 1980, following on from the repeat of Destiny of the Daleks. Airing across Tuesdays and Wednesdays from the 12th to the 20th of August, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which averaged out at 5.8 million viewers. Now, this may be an 8.7 million drop from the first broadcast, but like with the repeat of Destiny of the Daleks, the same factors are responsible here. The summer weather of August kept more people outside, and the popularity of ITV's Crossroads, which was now back on the air, didn't help matters either. It may not be my all-time favourite, but City of Death is loved and adored by many Doctor Who fans, some even citing it as the greatest story of all time. 
To decide how high you'll place it, you can read the BBC Books release from 2015 or the Target adaptation from 2018. There's an audio adaptation of the BBC Books release and also a release of the original TV soundtrack from 2012. To watch it, you have the original VHS release from 1991 and also a re-release with different artwork in 2001. A few years later, a standalone DVD was released in 2005. This story certainly features some of the best performances and chemistry from Tom Baker and Lala Ward, and it's often cited that the trip to Paris to shoot the scenes was the time when the two of them would later develop a relationship in real life, but more on that when we get there. Filled with delicious comedies, some really neat cameos, an interesting story and some superb guest casting, City of Death certainly does have a lot going for it. It's not the greatest story of all time in my opinion, but it certainly has a lot of merit to it. Check it out, and remember to look for some fakes the next time you visit your local art museum. Oh! I say, what a wonderful butler, he's so violent, hello. The third story from season 17 is The Creature from the Pit. A distress signal brings the TARDIS to Chloris, a jungle world ruled by Lady Adrasta. Adrasta controls the planet's scarce supplies of metal, throwing anybody who defies her into the pit. What horror will the Doctor discover there? This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 27th of October 1979 and concluded on the 17th of November. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and this is certainly quite the marked decline. Despite not achieving the mega heights of Destiny of the Daleks or City of Death, half of Creature from the Pit manages to cross the 10 million mark, part 2 providing the story's peak at 10.8 million viewers. And with the lowest viewed episode being part 1 with 9.3 million, despite the huge drop, these are still very strong results. For the top 40 TV programs, all but part 1 were able to gain a place on the chart, part 2 just missing out on the top 20, as that finished up at 23rd place. So, why did Creature from the Pit receive far less of an audience than the preceding stories? Well, it may seem like the obvious candidate, but on the 24th of October, three days before this adventure began, ITV returned triumphantly to the screens after being off air for nearly three months. With their popular shows returning, such as Coronation Street and The Muppet Show, millions of viewers flicked to the other side to either catch up on their much-missed programming or tuned in from curiosity to see what had changed on the network. Having said that, the competition ITV decided to foster against Doctor Who was relatively lacklustre. Part 1 went out against Gold, a thriller movie first released in 1974, and then for the next three weeks a variety of either John Wayne's western movies or US import chips. And whilst The Creature from the Pit suffered a dive in viewers from City of Death, the numbers it did pull in were still considerably higher than this time last season. Promotion-wise, K9 made an appearance on popular children's show Blue Peter, where he chatted with the hosts, whilst also showcasing a segment from the adventure itself. In the print world, there was nothing too out of the ordinary in the Radio Times listings magazine, but the lead actors popped up in various places amongst different publications. Tom Baker gave an interview to the South Wales Echo, in which he confirmed that he was remaining with the show into 1981, and also that he wished for Miriam Margulies to be his companion. Now, that would have been quite the team-up. Lala Ward, however, was appearing in headlines for less light-hearted reasons. The Daily Express ran a headline on the day of Part 4's broadcast, in which Lala proclaimed her furiousness over the re-release of a film she had made in 1973. This film had been recut with additional scenes of a sexual nature, and had been retitled to a more eye-grabbing name. And without informing Lala, I would argue her fury was justified. There was no special trailers for the story, but to be honest, after coasting for the past few months due to their main rival being off air, it could have taken the BBC some time to recognise that they may have to start pushing their programmes again. The Creature from the Pit is one of those stories that often gets brushed aside on retrospectives and rewatches. It certainly does have its moments of silliness, and with a monster that looks, well, like that, which certainly doesn't do the story any favours, but it does have its fans, just like all Doctor Who stories do. But for me, I honestly find this to be one of the most forgettable stories in the Tom Baker era. I really do enjoy Myra Francis's performance as a Draster, but that aside, the story itself doesn't grip me too much. The leads in my view aren't necessarily on the top of their game, and ultimately, it's not one I return to. But hey, we have an endless number of memes from this… creature, so that's something I suppose. Overall, this story attracted an average of 10 million viewers, an enormous 4.5 million drop from the previous story. This is one of, if not the sharpest drop we've seen on our journey so far, but again, from the factors we've looked at, it's hardly the sign that the show was suddenly in trouble. 10 million viewers is still a lot of people, 
and they must have enjoyed it to some degree for that number to be sustained during the story's four week run. To see if The Creature from the Pit is a story that you enjoy, you can read The Target Book from 1981 or its audio adaptation from 2008. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 2002, one of the last stories to be released on the format, and there's also a standalone DVD release, which came out in 2010. The Creature from the Pit is a story that has lots of decent ideas, but ultimately doesn't manage to pull them off, at least in my opinion. The show was still having its budget stretched to the limit, and with strikes amongst various production departments remaining ever-present, causing delays, and in certain effects being abandoned, you have to admire it for trying. But, again, for me at least, it's a story that unless specifically requested, I probably wouldn't sit down to watch again anytime soon. But do check it out for yourself, because who knows, when you do, you may have found yourself a new favourite. Hello, I am the Doctor. Friend. Friend. The fourth story from Season 17 is Nightmare of Eden. When two ships collide in hyperspace, they become fused together. The Doctor must find the connection between savage creatures emerging from dimensional instabilities and a drug smuggling operation. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 24th of November 1979 and concluded on the 15th of December. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and whilst the numbers seem to remain consistent, there's another noticeable difference from before. Notably that no episode of The Nightmare of Eden managed to cross over the 10 million mark. Three of the story's four parts just missed out on the milestone, with parts two and three providing the peak, with 9.6 million households tuning in. Part one falls one step lower with 8.7 million, but again, like with the viewing figures attained by the creature from the pit, this is hardly a sign of a catastrophic failure. In terms of the top 40 TV programs, three of the story's four parts were able to make the chart, part two ranking the highest at 31st place, and with part one ever so slightly missing out, as that finished at 41st. So, with viewing figures gradually on the decline, what was it about Nightmare of Eden that caused the drop? Well, the relative lack of promotion certainly wouldn't have helped. Despite issuing material for the story to the press in October, by the time the story began transmitting a month later, pictures of the villainous mandrels hadn't been seen at all. This prompted a somewhat false headline in the tabloids, citing that these creatures were far too terrifying to be printed, based off the lack of photos, but also of quotes from members of the production team who claimed that they had been terrified when first seeing them. When questioned about the lack of publicity for these oh-so-frightening monsters, a BBC spokesperson said that the corporation were short of photographers that day. Take that for what you will. With very lacklustre promotion, what arguably made things worse was the fact that ITV, now fully back on the air, had regained much of the audience share it had previously lost over the past few months. Competition was very varied, with regions like London airing chips, several airing old westerns, and some going for former challenges to Doctor Who, such as Happy Days. Mork and Mindy, a sci-fi sitcom, also went out against Doctor Who in the ATV region, but the vast majority of smaller areas aired the evening class sitcom, Mind Your Language. As the other side continued to resume normal operation, the increase in competition meant that Doctor Who really needed to stand up and not rest on its laurels. And in the BBC's behalf, especially in regards to promotion, they arguably did. It is a shame, really because Nightmare of Eden is a story that I think deserves a bit more attention, both back in 1979 and today too. The story's central concept deals with drug addiction, a very real topic that was in many ways bold territory for the show. The mandrels themselves, whilst perhaps not being as frightening as hyped up by the tabloids, still remain an effective monster in certain scenes. I say certain because there are others where they feel a bit too cuddly. Like Creature from the Pit, Nightmare of Eden is often overlooked for the overabundance of humour and whimsy, and some definite overacting going on by certain cast members. So, whilst for me it may not be a personal favourite, I can see the shining factors within it, and I'm glad that it's slowly but surely getting the reappraisal that it deserves. Overall, this story attracted an average of 9.3 million viewers, a 0.7 drop from the previous story. Whilst it is a shame to see things decline again as we get further into Season 17, it is important to keep in mind that for Doctor Who's age at the time, and the return of the ITV competition, a 9.3 million average is certainly not to be sniffed at. Nightmare of Eden is the most redeemable story from season 17, I think. As in a story that for a long time has been ignored and pushed to the sidelines, in the shadow of other stories from this run such as City of Death. There's a lot of good hidden within there, and if you want to see if you can find it for yourself, you can read the Target book from 1980, but there's no audio adaptation as of yet. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1999, or a standalone DVD release from 2012. 
With an engaging storyline, Nightmare of Eden is certainly worth your time, even if it's just the once. Whilst I don't warm to some of the performances, and the comedic element continuing to grow ever dominant within the show's fabric, there is a lot I do enjoy about Nightmare of Eden. I do have a soft spot for those big old mandrels, whether they're looking like overgrown teddy bears, or in the few moments where their sinister intent and impact is fully carried over. Ah. Oh, my fingers, my arms, my legs, ah. my everything. Oh. The fifth and penultimate story from season 17 is the horns of Naimon. The glory days of the Skonon Empire are long past, but the Naimon has promised a return to greatness. The Doctor is determined to discover the monstrous truth behind the Naimon's plan. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 22nd of December, 1979, and concluded on the 12th of January, 1980. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and I must say, we really do have a mishmash of numbers here, don't we? Whilst part four does manage to once again cross the 10 million barrier, providing the story's peak at 10.4 million viewers, it's the figure for part one that proves the most alarming. The opening instalment drew in just 6 million viewers, making it the lowest viewed individual episode of the season by far, and also the lowest viewed individual episode since part five of The Time Monster, from all the way back in 1972. For the top 40 TV programs, part three just scraped in at 40th place, and part four climbed significantly higher, finishing at 26th. Part 2 charted 56th, and Part 1 had the rare distinction of falling into triple digits, as it ended up at 100th place. So, with a rather shocking start to Part 1, did the Horns of Naimon warrant the viewing figures that it received? Well, in terms of promotion, the story didn't receive a great deal, just like Creature from the Pit and Nightmare of Eden before it. The only major piece outside of the usual listings in the Radio Times was an appearance from Lala Ward on the Multicoloured Swap Shop, a popular Saturday morning children's show in which she chatted with younger viewers, and also gave away some bits and pieces of Doctor Who merchandise. Clips from part one of the story were shown, which combined with a photo of Lala in that week's Radio Times could have helped boost part two's figure up by 2.8 million. However, the day part two aired on the 29th of December, that fell within the festive schedules of the BBC, and with Christmas time TV becoming much more of a family staple by the late 70s, it's reassuring that the increase in viewers watching TV were mainly focused in on Doctor Who when it came to Saturday tea time. Competition on ITV was once again varied, with many of the same programmes returning to challenge Doctor Who, combined with some seasonal programming going against parts 1 and 2, it could be these programmes in particular that caused part 1 to have such a low figure, as when transmitting on the 22nd of December, the build-up to Christmas on TV would have been reaching its peak. The Horns of Naimon is yet another example of season 17 suffering from stuff going on either in front of or behind the cameras. For one, the scriptwriter and former script editor, Anthony Reid, expressed his disappointment at how the serial turned out. He believed things had been camped up during production, and when you watch The Horns of Naimon, I would argue it's difficult to disagree with him. But saying that, people either hate this story for its silliness, or they absolutely adore it. What do I adore the most? This guy. Soldeed, played by Graham Crowden, is absolutely hilarious. Whether it was the intention or not, He's the sole reason I come back to watch The Horns of Naimon, purely for the fact that he makes me smile and chuckle to myself every time he appears on screen. That might not be the best grounds to praise a story, but whereas I can easily forget about tales like Creature from the Pit, I remember The Horns of Naimon for performances like this. So, if you're in for a laugh, grab your snacks and your drinks, get a few mates round, and just bask in what The Horns of Naimon has to offer you. You'll either be surprisingly entertained, or hideously disappointed. Let's hope it's the former, eh? Overall, this story attracted an average of 8.8 .8 million viewers, a 0.5 drop from the previous story. Unlike season 15, where the downward trend eventually became an upward one, the same occurrence has not happened here, with now every story following City of Death receiving less and less viewership. But again, come on, 8.8 .8 million viewers over four weeks for a 16-year-old program that's facing off against tough competition with relatively little promotion? That's still a success, I would argue. Not phenomenal or exceptional, but still very respectable. The Horns of Naimon to many may feel like a very limp ending to season 17, especially if you aren't a fan of all the ridiculousness going on, but again, if you lean into that silliness, if you switch off the analytical part of your brain and just have some fun, then I would hope this story can provide that to some degree. To find out for yourself, you can read the Target book from 1980, but there's no audio adaptation as of yet. To watch it, it was one of the last stories to be released on VHS in the June of 2003, and a few years later, it was released as part of the Myths and Legends box set in 2010. 
Yes, it has the creatures with the funny horns. Yes, it has a villain who frequently crosses over into the realm of pantomime. But if you embrace it all, it can make for one of the most entertaining stories that Season 17 has to offer. It's not my standout story, but like The Nightmare of Eden, I believe it deserves another chance to try and win you over. Or make you roll about laughing at how mad it is. That's very odd. The sixth and final yet unaired story from Season 17 is Sharda. Visiting Cambridge, the Doctor and Romana discover that the ruthless Skagra is eager to acquire an ancient book, possessed by retired Time Lord Professor Cronotis. The book is the key to locating Sharda, which in turn will allow Skagra to control the universe. This story is comprised of six episodes, which was planned to begin airing on the 19th of January, 1980, and conclude on the 23rd of February. Now normally I would show you the individual viewing figures for all six episodes, but as you've probably guessed, I can't do that because the serial was never transmitted. But why was this? The answer was due to industrial action, a theme that has popped up so many times throughout season 17, both in relation to competition at ITV, but also with the BBC itself. Problems have been growing for months, and in November of 1979, while Sharda was being filmed, this came to a head when a strike began, causing the studios that Doctor Who was filmed in to become unavailable. When the strike concluded at the end of the month, producer Graham Williams had hoped that the remounting of the lost filming sessions could be done over the Christmas period. However, the BBC decided to prioritise festive programming that had been delayed due to the strike. As a result, Doctor Who wouldn't be able to have its remounts for Sharda until after January of 1980, which would have been part way through the story's planned broadcast. With the prospect of refilming now impossible, Williams instructed director Pennant Roberts to abandon Sharda completely thus bringing season 17 to a premature end six weeks earlier than planned. Around 50% of the serial had completed filming, including the location work at Cambridge and several studio scenes in Cronotus's library amongst others. It is a shame that the story couldn't be completely finished, particularly as it was written by the then script editor Douglas Adams. Fans who had enjoyed his work on stories like The Pirate Planet and City of Death were sadly robbed of a true season finale with Adams's work truly at the forefront. Having said that, with half of the story roughly in the can, there is material from Sharda that can be viewed, and indeed some of that material was first seen in the 20th anniversary story, The Five Doctors. The elusiveness of the story has prompted several attempts at offering a completed version. To experience one of these attempts at completion for yourself, you can read the BBC Books novel from 2012, or listen to the audio adaptation of the same book. To watch it, you have a VHS release from 1992, where missing segments were filled by newly filmed links performed by Tom Baker, and in 2003, Big Finish teamed up with BBC I to create an animated webcast of Sharda to help celebrate Doctor Who's 40th anniversary. This version featured Paul McGann as the 8th Doctor, and Big Finish would later release the audio version of this webcast on CD. Alternatively, it was released on DVD in 2013, as part of the Legacy Collection box set. A few years later, in 2017, the missing or unfilmed parts of Sharda were animated and released on DVD, Blu-ray and Blu-ray Steelbook, the latter containing a bonus disc that contain both the VHS release and the 2003 webcast. Sharda remains an intriguing piece of Doctor Who history, over 40 years since it was originally abandoned. Whilst it's easy to focus on the negatives, the way it prematurely ended the season, how it took out some of the wind in Doctor Who's introduction to the 80s, how producer Graham Williams and script editor Douglas Adams' hopes of a big finale were dashed away from them. But I'd argue there are many positives to take away from what we have of Sharda. For one, the scenes that were filmed are some of the most fun and witty of all of season 17, as well as some of the most charming. Furthermore, the incompleteness of the episode has prompted all of these subsequent revisions, a testament to the dedication of those who love Doctor Who. Of course we all wish that it could have been transmitted in its complete form back in 1980, but as it stands, Sharda will remain one of the rare times that a Doctor Who story just couldn't fully materialise onto our television screens. So that's season 17, the six stories that comprise it and the ratings that five of them garnered. With the transmission of episode 6 of The Horns of Nymon, season 17 was brought to an end, concluding a shorter five month run comprised of 20 episodes across five stories. Now let's have a look at the story averages for this season. You can clearly see the point where ITV made it back onto the airwaves to steal away audiences, as the decline from City of Death to the creature from the pit remains so staggering. 
City of Death itself proves to be the most viewed part of the season, with a whopping 14.5 million watching on average, the highest average ever recorded for a Doctor Who story thus far. The low point comes with the premature season finale, The Horns of Nymon, which is almost 6 million behind City with 8.8 .8 million viewers, but again, when your lowest result is not too far off from double digits, it shows that Doctor Who very much was the national institution that it proclaimed to be. So much so that even when the competition returned and the promotion wasn't as present, that nearly 10 million viewers every single week tuned in to see where the TARDIS team would end up next. Now, as we always do, let's work out the overall average for this season. By combining the average ratings for each story, we can calculate that the average viewing figures for Season 17 of Doctor Who stands at around roughly 11.2 million viewers. This is a huge 3.6 million increase from Season 16's average, and it now actually ties for first place with the average attained by Season 14, which also averaged 11.2 million viewers across its 7 month run. Perhaps if ITV had remained off the air for longer, or if Sharda had made it to air, or if the promotional efforts for Doctor Who had been ramped up when the other side did return, then we could have seen a new record holder for the most watched season of the programme. But, as it stands, it will take first place alongside season 14. Will it be toppled by what's coming in the future? Time will tell. Always does. When we look at the six Tom Baker seasons we've analysed thus far, season 17 stands out as having quite the sharp boost from the previous two years. And again, a lot of it you could pin down to the ITV strike, but I think the fact viewers for the most part stuck around afterwards shows that these stories were at least eye-catching and entertaining if nothing else. Season 17 is a very bizarre point in the Tom Baker years if you ask me. On the one hand, you have stories like City of Death, a tale which frequently tops people's favourite list, one brimming with so much quality that you'd think the rest of the season is equally as strong from how people talk about this one adventure. But then to contrast that, you have stories like Creature from the Pit or The Horns of Naimon, which, to be fair, are suffering a bit production-wise due to goings on behind the scenes, but with over-the-top performances, ropey action pieces, and monsters that are… questionable, it really does tip the mood and feel of Season 17 almost on a story-by-story -story basis. Whilst Destiny of the Daleks remains a guilty pleasure for me, and Nightmare of Eden surprised me with how strong the story could be, ultimately, this set of stories is not one I return to often for one reason or another. And with its conclusion, this marked the departure of Douglas Adams as script editor and Graham Williams as producer. The latter, in his three year tenure, had helped shift the tone of the program from a more horror based style to one focused on fantasy and the spirit of adventure, with lots of comedy and light heartedness thrown in. The Williams era is certainly not for everyone. I myself prefer the earlier Hinchcliffe years of the Tom Baker era, but I do know many people who look at these three years, and season 17 in particular, very fondly. Whether it's the sheer fun a lot of these stories hold, the blossoming chemistry between the two leads, or the fact that many of these stories made it to air at all, Season 17 remains a set of stories that holds many fascinating elements that millions continue to enjoy. But as the 1980s were coming in, someone new would have to take up the producer's mantle. Someone who could truly change and adapt Doctor Who for the brand new decade, and also make sweeping changes on and off screen. Who could take up such a task? You'll have to tune in next time to find out. So those are the ratings details for Season 17. I hope you enjoyed this numerical look back at a bunch of stories that really epitomise the crazy wildness of the Tom Baker era, and despite their critics, many of them do hold a lot of fun that you can still enjoy today. If you want to enjoy more Doctor Who content, then I highly recommend you check out Time of the Whovians United, a great group of creatives who make some wonderful Who-related videos across both the classic and revival eras of the programme. If you want to read more about Doctor Who in the making of it, I highly recommend the Complete History series of books, which I used as reference for this video. If you want to keep up to date with this series, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and if you want to see new episodes of the series early, then you can by supporting us on Patreon or via my Ko-fi page. Please consider leaving a like, subscribing to the channel, and leaving your thoughts on Season 17 in the comments section below. I've been Adam Martin from AMTV, and we will see you next time for Season 18.